Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Pulling Around Show. I'm your host, Chris Wilmoth. And today, our guest is professional pool player and author, Max Everly. Max, uh, appreciate you joining me today. Happy to be here, Chris. Thank you, man. Yeah. Like I told you, this is uh, basically, I do these shows. It's basically for people to get to know you a little bit beyond the pool table. Um, also hear a few of your, few of your war stories. Um, but my goal is also to kind of keep the history, some of the history of pool, um, and kind of bring it current. So, so people can, people can listen to the stories, you know, like, like a lot that we don't have, like the legends that have already passed on. Um, so how did, what got you into playing pool? My grandpa got me into playing. We had a table that my dad convinced the YMCA to sell to him when he was 16. He told them that it was bringing the wrong element into the YMCA. And they they uh, bit what he was telling them and sold it to him for $100 with all the sticks and balls. So uh, my, my grandpa bought the table and knocked out a wall in the basement because he was a contractor, put up an I-beam. And then that table, the Brunswick commander has been there in the family ever since and, that, and that's the table i learned to play on and uh so did my cousin danny and my brothers steven and will and my dad rob uh, my uncle dave um so we, we were playing under the pool table when i was a kid my brother and i and then we'd roll the balls around when i got tall enough to see and then yeah. finally when i was five or six i could play and uh you know it was just always there part of the part of the family in ohio even though I grew up in Virginia, I was born in Ohio right? and would always go back to visit. And then when I was 12, Thanksgiving one year, I was back for a visit in Ohio. And uh, my, my grandpa told me to hit the two ball with right English and I would hit the nine and make the nine. And, and I made it went in just like he said, and I won the game and I was hooked from then. And then he started teaching me cue ball control and I'd watch him with his bridge and it would just uh, it, then my my uh, my uncle got me Robert Burns standard book on mm -hmm. pool and billiards. I think when I was fifteen, and then my game just shot up real fast from there because I, I just started with the first shot in the book and, until I could shoot it. Would go at every page until I mastered it. Basically, that that book's amazing. Yeah, Do you have that book? I don't. I had I've, I've watched his video. I'm not much of a reader, but I've watched some of his some of his videos about getting it getting into the, to the zone. And, you know, um, when I didn't, when I didn't fall asleep listening to him, um, so Robert Byrne. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so your, your grandpa introduced you to the game. When did you, uh, when did you realize, Hey, th that you could, that you could do this for a living? I think it was watching Mike Siegel and Nick Varner, Earl Strickland, Buddy Hall on TV, wearing a tuxedo, playing uh, in a in a ballroom with chandeliers for for forty thousand dollars. I remember first place. I think that was. Uh, I think I started watching those around eighty three, eighty four, and uh, that. So that that's. I think it was nineteen eighty four. That's when I decided I wanted to become a professional pool player. I was twelve years old, and just watching those guys on TV. And then the color money came out a couple of years later in 1986. It was like it was made for me, right? You know, and pool was just it just got hot from then on. I mean, yeah. it blew up with that movie. And then the 90s, then the junior national started in '89. So everything just was right at the right timing for me when I was a a, a young, a young teenager. Um, it it was awesome. What a, what a great time to be coming up in pool, you know. And and I think now is too also. Because it's it's so international, um, but Dan was really special. You could go to the trade show, see Willie Moscone, meet Moscone, Siegel, Varner, uh, David Howard was the first pro I ever saw. I saw him wearing a suit walking down into the trade show. I was like, Mom, Mom, that's David Howard. And because uh, I I was there for the Junior Nationals, right? Which Chan Witt won in 1989. Um, he he was a great young player from Lewisburg, West Virginia. His dad taught him how to play since he was a little tiny kid. Like he was a video of him playing when he was one and a half years old. And then uh, I saw this magazine 
feature on him. I think, yeah, my, right around when I was 16, saying that he's the best junior in the country. And I was like, Mom, my, who is this kid? I, I, I can beat this guy or something. And uh, I ended up meeting him. And uh, he beat me in the Lewisburg, not Lewisburg, but uh, Downingtown, Pennsylvania. They had a junior nationals. And I think he had won it before. So I ended up playing him. Uh, in some round, I think he beat me like Hill Hill. Uh, he he was a great player. I think uh, Dennis Hatch had won that tournament before. Uh, Tony Tony, uh, what's his name? Uh, Tony, the great great young player from North Carolina. Um, Tony Watson. Watson. Tony Watson. Yeah, I think he won it later. But um, yeah, Chan, Chan. He beat me nine eight. I made it to the finals of that. He beat me nine to eight. It was like the. Uh, the the second year I was in it, I remember that. I had to beat him twice, though. But um, I remember it came down to uh, some bank shot or something. Um, and then his dad started teaching me a little bit. We became friends. His dad gave me some pointers on fundamentals. And I changed them around a little bit. And then again, later with him, when I was 25, I spent some more time with him and really uh, implemented most of the stuff that he was talking about. Uh, with Chan, because Chan had great fundamentals. Um, it's Alan Hopkins said that he was going to be the best player in the world by the time he was 18. I think this is when he was 15. And then he wins the first junior national championships. And uh, finally, I got back at him in the uh, when I was 18 in the finals of the junior BCA junior national eight ball championships. It was us again in the finals. I beat Michael Coltrane Hill Hill to uh, to get to the finals. I think he scratched on the break. I could talk forever about all this junior stuff it was a great time to be a junior very competitive right. and uh, a lot of fun and and then uh we'd have like gene belucas nick varner steve miserak were all at those finals when i played chan and finally finally beat him he beat me the first set and then i won the second set because i was on the winner side four two four two and uh but miserak was there watching like 300 people somebody got a video of that if, if you're watching this and you know who got a video of that 1991 junior national championship finals i'd love to to get a copy of that yeah i don't know who was filming that maybe um maybe john lewis knows i don't know if i asked him already uh, but were you watching any of that back in the day were you, we're, we're probably close to the same age were you yeah playing I, in any yeah you just turned 51 yeah I, I turned 50 on the 12th so all right november so, yeah yeah all right, happy birthday. Thank you. So mine and Johnny yeah. Archie's and Karen Core. Oh yeah. All three of our birthdays yeah. the same day. So so um number twelve. Yeah. Yeah. Um Whoa. so what was your uh what was your first pull, two piece pull cue? I think it didn't have a name. We went to Clark and Sons Billiard Supply in Canton. My dad and my grandpa took me there from Dover. And it was just this two piece with carved wood in the handle couple different colors of wood it was 42 dollars yeah and there was, there was no name on it and that was out was... for a couple of years and and then one time i went back to ohio and my grandpa had this two point white muchi muchi original mm -hmm. that he had for himself and i fell in love with it and he just gave it to me and then that, that's what i ended up winning the juniors and the collegiate nationals with played with that for a lot of years in, until uh, I finally won, I, I won a Joss Q, like a twenty five hundred dollar Joss in the in the Junior Nationals, plus a, a thirty five hundred dollar A. E. Schmidt pool table, and a thirty five hundred dollar scholarship, which I ended up using in college. My my uh, stepdad Tom, he was happy with that because he paid my college, right. so at least I paid one semester yeah. with pool. And um, so, yeah, and then I used that with the Joss. I traded in for a Sean, which I used for 15 years with a with a Predator a lot of those years, that first Predator mm -hmm. 314 shaft, which was a great combination. I think that was the and, best. Uh, I think it was the best shaft Predator made. Yeah, a lot of people think that. Yeah, with the pre-cat. Pre yep. 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 Um, so, so what's coming up for you? Uh, well, right now I'm I'm in Mexico. I'm right here by the beach in Ensenada. Came down to get a little R and R, uh, and I lived here for a couple of years when COVID began. Yeah, 
so I have some things down here and a lot of friends and there's some some cool pool halls. Uh, definitely the Derby City coming up. I think that's late January, but that's mm -hmm. a little ways off now. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking at the schedule. I wouldn't mind going to the Philippines. I think there might be a couple tournaments over there next month here in December. So I'm looking at that and looking at the schedule. Maybe there's something coming up like in Texas or I don't, I don't know. Maybe you can tell me what's a good tournament to go to between um, now and the Derby. Well, I know that uh, Space City Open is this weekend in Houston. Um, oh, man, I'm too late. I mean, that's – I'd have to leave today. It's already Thursday. It probably starts today, huh? Uh, prob probably so. Yeah, yeah. No, there's no way I'm going to that. Um, far as, as far as other than other than the Moscone Cup, I don't really know what's coming up in December. I run a lot of small events, but oh, everything, yeah? yeah, everything is either open rated or capped or – um, I can't, I can't get anybody to get in the open tournaments. If I do get somebody that's, you know, 650, 660 and above, nobody else, nobody else wants to play. So, um, time, times, times have changed. Man, that's, uh, that's really too bad. Yeah. We talk about this. Oh, yeah. Um, a lot. Well, players need to grow some balls, really. I mean, it's, uh, it wasn't like that. We we want to get better. The whole idea of getting better is playing players who are better than you and trying to beat them. Mm -hmm. You're not. You're just going backwards if you if you're just trying to get in these handicap tournaments. Maybe they just want to win money. But um, I don't know. A lot of players would rather lose ten thousand dollars in a casino, just putting it in a machine, than lose twenty dollars to a pool player who they have to face face to face and play man to man, woman to woman, whatever it is. Right. You know, uh, unfortunately, maybe that's part of the problem with American pool and plus all the bar tables. I love a bar. I can play on a bar table. Great. I play 15 ball rotation and I think it's a great little discipline. But for the most part, I knew growing up that I wanted to be a pro. So I always played on a nine foot table. Right. And that's one thing you should do if you if you play a lot of bar boxes, but you want to be a professional level player. Never let a day go by without playing on a nine foot table. And there's really no excuse. If you have a nine foot table in your town or wherever, then uh, you're just lazy if you don't get on that table and practice and get get your shots down, uh, and just quit playing on the bar box altogether. Maybe for periods of at a at a time, be, be, because it's not going to help you uh, with the shot making and the bigger area on the table and the longer shots. Right. It's good for cue ball control. I like it. The, the, it's very, it's awesome to be able to control the cue ball on a bar box. Uh, but but ninety percent of the players on a bar box uh, put them on a big table and they they got like zero chance playing a good uh, nine foot table player and then also play on a uh, a ten foot table if you can especially ten foot snooker table we had that in Virginia at Champion Billiards in Arlington I used to play on the, the ten foot snooker table with the pool balls play mm -hmm. a nine ball on it and do shot making drills and everything and then I'd go to a nine foot table and it felt like a bar box. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's and then you go around the world and they don't even know what a bar table is or a seven foot table is. Most places it's all nine foot tables or bigger. Like in Russia, it's 12 foot pyramid tables uh, and and nine foot nine foot are like the small table. And you go right? to Texas, you go to Texas and most of the bar tables in Texas are, are six and a half foot or six. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yep. That'll really mess you up. Um, they have a lot of eight foot tables in Texas, or they used to. They do. They do. Yeah. 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 Which so, is a cool size, also. Hmm. It's a cool. I like playing on an eight foot. It's a lot. It's real easy. Right. It's fun. It's good for cue ball control because it's a little bit tighter than a nine foot table. So it's good to practice. Like uh, Joe Balsis used to practice on an eight foot table. He said. Right. Before the World Championships, because it was tighter with the cue ball control. So that that would help him with his position play when he got to the uh, main tournament on the nine foot table. Correct. Right. A lot yeah. easier to adjust from the eight to the nine than the seven to the nine. Um. Yeah. That too. Who's your uh, Who's your favorite sparring partner? Oh, good question. Sparring partner. 
Oh, you know, uh, let's let's see. Um, well, I have a few friends who I spar with, kind of like maybe uh, six hundred level players, just friends around the around the West. But um, I don't know, maybe like a Lee Hugh Wagon. He's down in Florida. You know, you you heard of him? Hmm. Haven't. He's the best player you never heard of. He's from Minnesota, and. Uh, he was friends with Shane when Shane was a little kid, like six, seven. He knew Shane and he would pick Shane up and go take him to the pool hall and they, and they would play. And I, I think he had a big influence on on Shane's game uh, because Lee Hewagon is one of the best players this country's ever produced. And uh, he's down there in Florida playing. He's, he's, I don't know, maybe he's around my age or so. And, uh, he did well on the IPT. He's he's done well. He's been almost every top pro out there. Uh, but he dominated in Minnesota to where they they stopped letting him play. He, him and uh, Jimmy Witch. Yeah. They they, they uh, well you know it wouldn't let him play anymore. He was just too good. Just beat everybody too bad. Breaking and running six seven racks. I think he he broke and ran a seven pack gambling against Kid Delicious over there at, at Jimmy's place. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Lee Hewag and we 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 played a little bit down in florida he's a good guy we're good friends and uh i think he just won the florida state eight ball championship and that was on the nine foot table down there a couple two three weeks ago got a monster trophy for that so uh can, see if i can find him yeah yeah do do, do a little search for him and uh yeah just this real real great cue ball control uh, now growing up my sparring partner was garton Bierbauer who was a great player, maybe the best nine ball player I've ever seen. And uh, I was lucky to play him starting when I was 15. And that's really what brought my game up real fast besides just practicing and wanting to be great. And, and uh, but being able to play a great player, a truly great player and, and just rack for him and watch him play. It's different than just watching YouTube. Right. Because you see, you know, every, everything, what the player's doing, how they're hitting the ball. I mean, the video is okay. It's good. I mean, it's helped a lot of young players, I'm sure. Um, but but back then we didn't have all that. And so to be able to play with a real great player, and he was willing to help me, and now he's making great cues. Uh, he just had a stroke in, uh, over the last year. I think he's had a couple of mini strokes, but he's still able to make cues. I think he has someone helping him with some of the details, but man, he makes amazing cues. Garten Bierbauer. BeerBowerQs.com. If you want to check them out, they're real old school looking and hit real nice. They're they're hard to get a hold of, so the, the price is going way up on them. Yeah. If you if you can uh, if you're lucky enough to get one, you should probably hold on to it because they're going to be valuable, a lot more valuable even more into the future. I don't even have one yet, you know. <laughs> so I got to talk to him about getting one of those. Right now, I'm using a uh, Scott Gray Show Q from he's from Spokane. Yeah. And uh, he makes amazing cues. He kind of, I think he quit for seven years. Before that, he was really in the high end market. His cues were going for like 10, 15, 20,000. And he does really beautiful work. And, and uh, his cues hit great. Um, and one of my Pro Pool Academy members, um, Jess Magnus, he ended up, uh, we, we met this past summer. I was up in Idaho for most of the summer because I have family up in Bonners Ferry. And I uh, did a lot of fishing. Well, anyway, I met him, and and he was kind enough to give me a a Gracio Q because he has a nice collection going. And he he actually gave me one and put me in touch with Scott. Now Scott's making me um, a, a Q like a Purple Heart Q, and uh, I'm I'm experimenting with some of his shafts. Like he's just getting into carbon fiber shafts now, and he's right. Right. working on some cool stuff. But but the Q I have the Gracio is beautiful and the hit's amazing, and uh, it has a Keelwood shaft, the one I'm using right now. Um, because oh. I was using a mute for for a few years and yeah. a, and a mute shower, yeah. Um, has there ever been a time that you that you wanted to quit? I've thought about it. Uh, not. Um, it's hard to take that seriously when when you do it. Can, you can be you can get frustrated. I've never gotten bored with the game, but yeah, you you know you have your ups and downs. Sometimes you're not happy with how you're performing. Or, or a recent performance and uh, it can get tough financially if you don't perform well um, to say the least. So 
you know, a lot of, I think a lot of professional pool players around the world have probably considered that, or, you know, even guys like Thorson Holman was on the verge of quitting. And then he went ahead and uh, won the world nine ball, I think in 2003, uh, even though he had been sponsored by the government in, in uh, the military, most of his military duty was actually practicing pool. So for somehow the, uh, the German government has more appreciation for uh, someone with special talent, but even after all that, and uh, it, it was tough to be a professional and he, I think he was considering quitting. And then when he won that, it kind of changed everything for him. Uh, I haven't won a big one nine ball as big as, as the world championship. The closest I've gotten was second in the Derby city nine ball 2003. That that was the same year, actually lost a close one. And that I'd, I'd also won. That was right after I won the, uh, the hard times jamboree in Sacramento, California. Mm -hmm. and then right off the back of that, I almost won the Derby and I won the West coast nine ball like four or five times. And, a lot of bigger amateur events I've won, nine, nine ball. I've come close in a lot of major nine ball events, second, third, fourth, a bunch of fourths. I was ranked fifth two years in a row on the Pro Tour, almost made the Moscone Cup, missed it by like one point two years in a row, and then they put Earl Strickland in my place because they, they the fifth pick was based on, uh, you know, like what do you call it, wild card? Yeah. So Matchroom loves Earl, so he was ranked like 11, I was fifth, and then they put him in two years in a row. And – uh I almost got in again, 2019 and uh, almost actually again this year. Um, I had uh, Shane Wolford beat me in like four, four of the times we played. Had I beaten him, it might've been the other way around. I might've got on the Moscone cup. So, um, but I hope he does a great job and I think, I think he will. I think he deserves it. And I think that the U S I would say the U S isn't really uh, underdog. I, th I think nine ball is just streaky. Right. And, uh, you know, I think we have a good chance to win, not not just once, but, you know, two, three, four, five times in a row. That's just how nine ball is, you know. It is. It is. And so, going over, yeah. Going over there, going over there this year, make it a little bit tougher because they'll have that, what, six, the sixth man, you know, with the, with the fans. You know, they, uh, yeah. they're, they're a little more brutal over there than – than they are than we are here, but it but it's still makes it still makes it entertaining. Yeah, it'll be great. Um, yeah, the Europeans have come along a lot in the last twenty years. They they also have a little bit of an unfair advantage because if you're a top European player in your country, and the, you have an event sanctioned by the WPA, then you get money from your country and sponsorships and that's that's why the wpa has the power that they do because if you're ranked in the wpa then your country gives you money if you're a top european player in your country but not one american gets sponsorship from their country no that's, that's something i don't think anybody's talked about i haven't heard anybody talking about that so you got all these pro pool players from europe getting sponsored by their country to go all over and 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 then the and the u.s players don't have that and then everybody's like, well, the Europeans, uh, I don't know what the problem is with the Americans. You know, meanwhile, if we get sponsored, we might be dominating them uh, pretty bad. If, if our country was paying for us, for for the top 10 or 20 players to, to just play pool all day. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the sponsors gravitate to the European, the American companies with money, give a lot of money to the European players. And then everybody's wondering why the Europeans play so good. Yeah. Um, so th I think that has everything to do with one why the Europeans uh, started playing good. And I think that it's great for the sport, right? It's only, it's only good, but now it's time that the Americans get some support, uh, which really they don't from, from, uh, from our country or a lot of the sponsors, they want to give you like a few tips or a couple of cues and then have you promote them and try to get some money off of selling that. Right. You know, except for maybe a couple of players make some money. I had a really good sponsor in 2003 and four Fury cues. Right. Scott Taylor was or is the CEO of Sterling Gaming. Real smart guy. And back then it was really cheap to get Google ads and he was real smart with Google ads. And so he just when he launched his company, just just made tons of money because he was smarter than everybody else in the billiard industry. He knew how to advertise better. Right. So his company blew up and then he decided he would just create this Team Fury. 
And he his his idea was that you could just take anybody and call him a pro, and then nobody would know the difference. So he he uh, he got three pros, and then three guys who really weren't pro pro level, and uh, he put them all up on advertisements. Team Fury, and uh, you know it was it was great. It was great for me. Rodney Morris and Jose Perica were the other two pros, and myself. And you had um, Bobby Bobby Weimer. Um, let's see, Jason. Jason Kane and Frank Alvarez were like the amateur guys on Team Fury, mm-hmm. and uh, you know he, he it was Team Fury, and uh, but I got 100 percent sponsorship, 2003 and four, and uh, I'm, I'm that's when I got ranked top five, right? So if I had a, kept getting that sponsorship, who knows how many uh, majors I would have won or whatever? Because you really do need to focus on the game. Takes a little pressure off of you, yeah. Yeah, it's not just takes a little bit of pressure it's everything right if you're a professional that's what you got to do in your day from for eight eight hours a day at least you got to be working on your game right if you're not you're just bullshitting you're you're not going to beat these guys who are playing eight hours a day with full concentration got full funding to go all over the world and play in these tournaments it's a pipe dream if you think you're going to beat those guys right if you're not one of them right back then when i was one of them as far as actually being fully sponsored uh, my rank my ranking showed it right and uh, 2006, when the IPT came out, I had a full sponsor also. And that's when I got uh, third in the world straight pool. I almost won that, actually. I think I had a better better average than anybody in that tournament that year on, on running out. And uh, I just played a real bad match in the semifinals, but a little bit of pressure. And then they put the shot clock on us because we, we started playing a little bit slow. But when have you ever seen straight pool with the shot clock? Um, but, but I had so much, like 86 and outs, 120 six hundred twenty seven and out um ninety something and out I was just really close and real good in that tournament um but yeah no just to uh shine a little bit of light on one reason the Europeans are so successful um you know because but plus they play on nine foot table they don't have bar boxes over there they take the game serious but you know America has a lot of players who love the game and take it serious and who are great players right also right. So imagine we had a system where if you make it into the top 50 Americans, then you got full sponsorship on tour. I don't think the uh, the Asians and the Europeans would be liking that too much. Do you? No, not at all. Not at all. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, because it's no small American, thing. The American players, pros, you know, they rely, they have to, I mean, they have to win the tournament or they have to get in the money to support themselves if they're not getting full sponsorship, you know, and if, if where the Europeans are getting paid by the government, I mean, that pressure, that pressure is not there. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's huge. It's everything. It really is. Um, I think Shane's been very well supported since he was a kid mm-hmm. and, and it's, and it shows, right. He didn't just get up there scrapping his way to the top with no financial support he's had some some wealthy relatives and backers that have been really pushing him since he was a kid and right. um and, and i've been lucky enough to have that at times and when i do it shows and then when when other guys have that it shows in their game but a lot of times the americans are getting uh, backers and uh, then they have to split the money the backer wants like all their money back for expenses and then they're going to split the profits at the end of that Right. So it's real good for the backer because he's going to make sure he gets his money back. But the player's only getting half of the profits beyond the expenses to get to the tournament. Right. Right. So even if you get in the money pretty good, it's not looking that good. And then if you win, then you're giving up more than 50 percent of what what the actual first prize is for somebody who has one of those deals. Right. Mm-hmm. And I've done that several times. It's, it's not it's not fun. I don't really like doing it. But at this point, you're like screw it. I want to go play and I want to win. I don't care. I just want to win and I win some money, you know? Um, but I always like that when I'm back to myself and, uh, because then I make, make all the money and not worried about a sponsor. And then, right. and, and then, uh, so uh, that was cool back in 2003 for, uh, Scott Taylor to do that. I don't right. know many companies doing that, um, they think they can just get away with giving you a shaft and then and then uh, they give you a bunch of patches and say, well, if you uh, 
if you make it to a TV round and you win, we'll give you $500 yeah. if you're wearing the patch. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's not, that's not it's, it's bullshit. This whole industry is bullshit in the U.S. Like, like, um, you think that there's no money at all in the sport, but somebody's making money. I think even Matchroom's making money. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they won't reveal their numbers. They might be making billions for all we know. They're not going to pay the players more unless they have to. The prize money at the U.S. Open, the, the uh, Matchroom's U.S. Open, hasn't gone up in the last three years. I think it's been 50000 for first, 50000 for first, 50000 for first. Meanwhile, we have inflation. So that 50000 is actually worth less than it was each year. So the prize money is actually getting worse every year in Matchroom's U.S. Open. But, you know, they want to, like, hold the money and grow their brand, and they don't want to really pay the players until they have to, um, until the sport's so big and that, that the players can start demanding that kind of money, whatever money, right? Right. Until they actually have, like, agents. Because it's hard to take uh, a professional sport seriously if the athletes don't have agents or some type right. of professional somebody, representation. Somebody in their corner to fight for them. So right, or a players' union. Yeah, so I was fixing to ask you, do you think the players would benefit with a, with a players' union? Because without the players, there is no there is no tour, no match room. You know? Without right. the players, pool doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. Without the players and, and predators out there doing their thing, putting up putting up money, but but the uh, players don't really like Matt uh, Predators format, the race of four. No, oh, that's that's tough. The, yeah, they don't they don't they don't they don't like it. In fact, uh, there was almost a players meeting uh, or a, what do you call it? Players uh, group, right. players union formed a couple of years ago, but it didn't quite happen. It's hard. That's hard to do if it's actually not organized and led properly. Um, there needs to be like, like some attorneys involved or mm -hmm. one good attorney, I think. Right. And that um, and I and I think that's a good thing, if especially if uh, there's a lot of things the players don't agree with, whether it comes from the rules or the prize money or this or that. Um, but if the organization, the, the uh, organization putting on the tournaments was better then the need for the players union wouldn't be as much. You see what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, if everybody still, was happy with it. But yeah, but they'd still, they still need somebody to to represent them. But I mean, well, but yeah, it's, it's a good idea. Then that's just more money coming out of the player's pocket, going to their to their rep. What, what money? The the money to pay someone to represent them? Yeah, so like a retainer fee. You know, so that's just yeah. unless unless they have a a full sponsor, um, yeah, that would make it, that would make it pretty tough. Oh uh, yeah. What needs to be done is the, uh, an, or an actual professional organization. That's what I'm, I'm starting. Uh, well, you know, I've, I've written a business plan. I have uh, a brand for, it's called world pool tour. You can check it out at worldpooltour.com. And I got hats and shirts and stuff. You can, you can buy and check it out. I've been, people know about this in the industry i've been selling it like at, at some events and stuff and wearing the hats and you know so i haven't really talked too much about it actually publicly because i've been trying behind the scenes to raise the money so because i don't like making promises and right and just not having the money because i've been around for so long i've seen a lot of these these uh pro tours uh, who want to start and then they just never do anything or they don't continue because they don't have enough money really so that's really what I don't want to become. I didn't want to start some, make a bunch of promises. So I'm not, I'm not making any promises, but I am working on something because, you know, I mean, if you just wait around for someone to do it, it's never going to happen. If you want exactly. something done the right way, you got to do it yourself. Exactly. That, that's a hundred percent true in the billiard industry. You know, uh, that's just the way it is. But, you know, I think Matchroom is actually doing a lot of things right. I wouldn't have made the, the five ball purple. And I think uh win or break is the correct way to play any any sport any professional sport i mean alternate break they're they're doing winter break so uh in 2003 four, five, i was on the upa the board of directors the, the one that um charlie williams was getting into promoting and then started the upa we talked about doing a board of directors so we had that we had a couple of software guys in on it some guys with big money right 
and like Phil Muller down in Virginia, Tom Blazenko, another software guy out of the DC area. Real good guys. They love pool. They wanted to help out. And so we had this board of directors, Jeremy Jones, and I was the head of the rules committee. I wrote, I, I, I designed the UPA logo actually and wrote the mission statement. And a, as the head of the rules committee, I was pushing for alternate break because the big breakers were just dominating the game. And it was so easy to break and run, especially with the bigger break and that one ball on the spot. The, the fans don't actually like to see it. They they want to see close matches because you'd have a lot of matches. When, it, when it's winter break, you have matches where one player dominates and the, you don't even get to see the other guy. And, and maybe he flew here 2,000 miles, spent $5,000 just to sit and watch a guy break and run out on him. It would be like NFL football. Right. Every time the Chiefs score a touchdown, they get to receive the kickoff and go try to score another touchdown or kick a field goal. Right. Right. What sport in what sport does the scoring team receive the ball after they score? Right. Yeah, I understand that. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why this argument, I don't even think it's an argument that that I I don't lose this argument because it, it only makes sense. And I think a lot of people agree with me. And um, you have a lot more close matches when it's alternate break. Right. And the crowd loves it. That's what the crowd loves. Like the the, the uh, strong breakers, they'll, they'll say, no, the crowd wants to see a lot of breaking runs. And then comebacks, because you don't have comebacks. With winter, winter breaks, you get more comebacks. Well, the reason you have more comebacks is because one guy dominated to get up to six to zero. So now you have to have a comeback. Yeah, he better have winter break to come back from the other guy who did winter break. And then one mistake, the other guy is actually the guy with the lead is just going to close the match out 9 0 or 9 1 anyway. And then once in a while, you have a good comeback. But with alternate break, what you have are actually real professional matches where you're going you're to see both players right. and there's a big demand to perform on your break. It just makes sense. You know, I don't even think it I does. need to argue it with that. It's just obvious. Right. Even Mark White, the commentator, he's been talking about, he said that's the flaw of matchroom. And that, that's something that Mark and I agree on. I heard him say that a couple of days ago. Winter break is actually a major flaw. Um, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, especially nine balls, so easy to win a game. Right? You can just, someone can miss the five and you run out the five. Now you win a game of nine ball, you're making a nine on the break. What did you do that was so great to deserve to keep breaking? Why should you have to be be allowed to keep breaking in this nine ball, which is easy to break and run anyway? Well, I think that it's based off. So, like, if I mean somebody's matched up playing and they're gambling, that I mean that's winter break. I mean, Unless see. you specify alternate break, that's right. just a choice that the players make. It, but how often? I mean, how often have you seen that in the past? I, I have with me. Uh, yeah, just because players don't do it, they don't think about it. They're in the rut of thinking the same way. Doesn't mean it has to be that way. You know, because you know, yeah. Back when we used to gamble all the time, and people were giving up spots, the break was something that sometimes you had to give up. Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially somebody, you know, somebody like you know hillbilly, like Charlie Bryan. You yeah, know, Tom had the probably the biggest break in the world. And you take his break away. I mean, he's still a heck of a player, um, but you take one of his biggest strengths away. Well, yeah, that's it's huge, right? Yeah, especially winter break. It's it's ridiculous to give a guy with a big break the, the break every time he wins mm-hmm. is ridiculous. Yep. I mean, it's a thing. I mean, I believe I won tournaments winter break. I, I have a good nine ball break. Um, but you know, uh. I mean, look at Shane. Look how many tournaments he's won. Mm-hmm. He's got an incredible break, nine ball and ten ball. And he's, he's proven to be a great player also. He's 100%. He, he's won the Derby, one pocket. He's won the World Straight Pool now. Yes. Uh, he's won the World Eight Ball, right? He's a great player, 100%. Mm-hmm. And he was smart to work on his break. Um, but he would not have won that many tournaments if it was alternate break. He would not have won as many as he has, I don't think. I think that's pretty obvious. And there was that match nope. about 10 or 11 years ago where uh, they'd done the ultimate 10 ball in uh, Tunica, and that little Landon Shuffett was playing Earl on the playing 10 ball. 
if it wasn't for his him breaking so good, um, I don't, he would. There's no way he would have beat Earl, but he but he did. I mean, I think what Landon was 15 or 16 years old when that happened. Yeah, I was there. I watched that match. Um, actually, I won the Tunica Banks. They had a Banks on the ten foot table. Yeah, it's like a side event. I won that that year, and I won the straight pool in the ten foot table that year. It was like a pay or play tournament. Mm-hmm. This guy Eddie Assistant was doing. He was he was trying to get the a new thing started, where you could pay your way into the different levels of the tournament. Right, it was pretty cool actually. He started it in Vegas, and uh, it I I liked it. It was a good idea. I actually have a similar idea I've had for a long time. Uh, I'm not going to give the details away on that one. Yeah, because so much of my shit's been stolen from from my giant billiard dome. Mm-hmm. That's the big one that I've been working on my whole life. I started sketches for that when I was 20. Then my uncle, he's a great uh, computer graphics designer. He's a, actually a dome architect. And uh, so once I did the initial sketches, then he helped me get it into the computer with renderings. And I kept that thing so secret for so long and then had all these meetings with uh, hotel owners and casino owners and different investors. I just couldn't get any uh, traction with getting the funding to get it built. And uh, my, I let my buddy talk me into posting it on Facebook. And as soon as that happened, it got stolen by Madison Square Garden. And uh, two and a half years later, they they built it in uh, in Las Vegas, which the is sphere. the uh, the sphere. Yeah, looks exactly the same. The same, uh, other than being a pool hall, it's the same idea: multi-use entertainment center, right? Uh, to host concerts and uh, music events, comedy. And everything. The only difference is theirs is the uh, just not also a, a billiard stadium and pool hall. Um, but um, it, anyway, so you know, there, there was a lot of uh, you got to be careful what you put out there. Obviously, that was the wrong tactic. I never should have listened to my friend. Uh, that was probably the worst decision in my life. But um, at any rate, I'm still working on. I'm working on that still gonna i'm still planning on doing that along with my tour uh but right now i'm just enjoying playing and i and uh even though matchroom isn't perfect they put on a great event i i do really love playing the matchroom events it's just tough which is great i love tough pool tough opportunities you know uh vietnam i was over there actually i won one match and then i won two in the Perry open um and then I, I started playing better and won four matches at the international. But it really takes being out there playing a lot in these pro events to be tournament tough to kind heard, of uh, get on a roll, you know. Yeah, I heard uh, quite a few people got sick over there in Vietnam. I mean, just just come down ill. I don't know. If, did, did you witness any of that or experience any of that? I don't know if it's just too too hot in the room and they were getting dehydrated or something they ate. No, I got sick for a few days when I got back. After the international, I was sick for a few days. But I think it's because I ran out of vitamin C and forgot to go buy it because I take a lot of vitamin C every day, like 10,000 milligrams. I use like whatever 10, I use stands for. Huh? IU, whatever IU stands for. I uh, know uh, MG milligrams. Right. Well, okay. And or so, grams. So uh, yeah. you wrote a book, um, Zen Pool. How how long did it yeah. take? You, how long did it take you to write the book? That book uh, took place over a few years, because back in Virginia. Uh, the tap league Mm -hmm. i knew the founders of that the association for pool and they asked me to write a a, a instructional column in their newsletter okay so that's when i started writing articles and then uh over the years it just added up when i was living in la 2006 that's i I decided to compile it into a book and that's how uh, zen pool came about because my mom used to tell me Zen pool, Max, Zen pool, when I would leave the house to go play in a tournament, right? She was a big supporter, so. Um, and uh, 
that so that that first book is really a compilation of all the articles so it covers a lot of different subjects from fundamentals to mental game to match play to from all the experience i've had mm -hmm. over the years to stroke to aim and uh it's real easy to read it's not real long so a lot of people who who uh, don't like to read told me they like to read that book because you can just pick it up and open it to any chapter it's only going to be like one two three four pages long the chapter mm -hmm. and um it, you know I, I guess my writing is pre pretty easy to understand I, i'm a college graduate i got a degree from james madison university in virginia mm -hmm. and i've done a lot of creative writing and i got good grades and you know so so uh you know there's a little bit behind the book and um terms of my education and stuff but also just my, my i've been also been teaching pool since i was 18 professionally so uh now we have an audio book which i recorded and uh my friend jason call actually recorded the audio book for my next book which is play pool in the zone which you can get that on kindle just as a kindle book mm -hmm. and um i don't he he did the audio book which, which uh, I, I'm, I was trying to get up to Audible, but it wasn't working. And then I ha I, also, I do have that available on disc, though, if you want to hear that. And then um, the Pro Pool Academy first came about when I made the, the DVD set, Powerful Pool World Class Fundamentals, in 2008, 2009. And that, that's, like, really extensive on the fundamentals. It's like a four-hour and 40-minute DVD set, three discs. And then from there, I just kept making videos and, and decided to put them into a website where you could just you could buy access to the website instead of just putting everything on DVD. So the DVD content is in the website, plus all the videos I made. There's like 15 modules in there, eight ball, nine ball, 10 ball drills, uh, pre-shot routine. Uh, you can check it out, propoolacademy.com, right. everything that's in there. Right. And, um, I'll, it's, I'll yeah. leave that link in the description below. Um, also, you get your copy of, of Max's book, Zen Pool. Um, you can go to zenpoolbook.com, which I'll leave that description, leave that link in the description below. Um, you also go to his pro, 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 propoolacademy.com and you join that. And you, he said you also get the book for free. Yeah, you get the uh, audio book and the ebook. If you pay a little more, you get the, I'll send you the book and the DVD in the mail along with lifetime access to the website all right so yeah it's a really good deal and, and uh then also give lessons but even if you take lessons it's good to join the website first because i cover a lot in that website over 33 hours of video content in there and um so then we, we or or we could do a lesson like anywhere from one to six hours um they're not inexpensive because I, if i have to travel to you that's 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 pretty expensive and uh you know you're not just paying for my time you're paying for what i offer and and uh for the time that you're saving instead of floundering around for 10 20 years trying to figure it out you get an expert who can help you and watch what you're doing when, when i do a lesson i actually i don't do much shooting it's mostly my student and i'm watching you every shot and helping you with your fundamentals right. uh, which is really important because some some famous instructors out there, they, they want to do all the shooting and think that that's going to help by watching you just doing what they're doing. But that's not how how, to, how you improve. You improve by you shooting, and I'm going to help you do what you do better. Right. 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 Um, right. And there, well, there's Max, a lot of good instructors out there. Yeah. Well, Max, I appreciate your time. I told you I wouldn't keep you, keep you too long. Um, guys, if you uh, enjoy content, enjoyed this content hit the subscribe button down below give us a thumbs up and leave us a comment and let us know how we're doing and we'll see you next time on the pulling around show max appreciate your time buddy hey chris thanks have man have a, Same have, here. A merry, have a merry christmas and, and uh and be safe in mexico <laughs> i will thank All you right. very much merry christmas you too see ya thank you